Good afternoon, or maybe good morning, or good evening, depending on where you are. So my name is uh, Bruno, I'll be your host uh, through this webinar. We're going to talk about the role of HR in agility, so the role of human resources. And uh, as you know, agility is a pretty hot topic because the world is becoming more and more volatile, more uncertain, and there are more and more changes. So companies, organizations, have to become adaptable, they have to become agile. It's not just nice to be, it has become a must. But what does it mean to become agile? What are the factors of agility? So some would tell you, oh, it's about the methodology, like doing Scrum in software development, for example, or in production. Others will tell you, no, it's about the culture. And yet others will tell you it's more about the management style, the, the leadership style, or maybe the way the organization is designed itself in terms of, of levels, of our functions, maybe just the skills of people. The truth is that it's a bit of each of these. And what we're sure of though, is that the way we manage people, the way we manage human resources, has a huge impact on these factors. Therefore, we believe that human resource management is a critical enabler for agility. So this webinar is planned to last uh, 50 minutes there will be approximately uh, five to 10 minutes in the end for questions and answers. So I encourage you to share your questions, your insights, your comments. There should be a chat box to the right of your screen or maybe somewhere else if it's not a device. So don't uh, forget to, to share your questions. This is the way to make the most out of this webinar. So we're going to specifically address uh, three, three questions today. So the first one, why Agile in the first place? Why is it important in, in particular? Why is it important to human resource management? The second, Agility is a very broad word. It means different things to different people. And in order to understand the different tactics that HR can use, we'll need to have a look at the different types of Agility, the facets of Agility. And third one, maybe the most important, based on that, we'll be able to explore concretely what is the impact of agility on some key uh, HR responsibilities, such as defining jobs or recruitment? So in this webinar, I'm going to use the word HR, HR function very loosely. I don't want to give you the impression that this is only for people who, are, uh, who have an official HR title or who are working specifically in the HR department. Basically, this information should be valuable for anyone who is involved in managing people or in developing talent, which typically goes way beyond official HR people, fortunately. So let's get right away into the topic itself. So first big question, why agility? Why are organizations asking or trying to become agile? Well, the reasons fall into three overarching goals. And the first one is that, is that we'd like to deliver our stuff faster. So accelerate the product cycle, getting our products services faster to our clients, for example. And the, word, the key word here is, of course, acceleration. The second large goal is we'd like to be able to, uh, to react to changes faster and better, but not just reacting, anticipating change, leading the change. And the words here are adaptation and innovation. And the third overarching goal, which is maybe a bit more explicit to our people who are professionals in HR, it, we'd like to use agility, we'd like to, be, we'd like to become agile in order to better attract talent and keeping people engaged, mobilized in organization. And if we see here at the right hand side, the HR responsibilities, what, of course, it's a simplification. It's, no, it by, it's by no means exhaustive. But uh, what do HR people do typically in the organization? They recruit people, they define jobs, they set up the way to uh, appraise performance of people, they develop career plans and uh, skills development plans, and so on. And the question here, the question for you, for me is, okay, but is there a relationship between why Agile and HR responsibilities? And the answer is obviously yes, because Imagine I'd like to become more adaptable as an organization. Well, I will certainly recruit a hire different type of people, maybe people who are more used to uh, be to face change and adapt through their career. 
I will also define the jobs or the functions differently to emphasize versatility and learning and developing other skills. I will also uh, change the way performance is managed to encourage some behaviors that are in line with adaptation and innovation. For example, uh, learning by sometimes making mistakes, experimenting, taking initiatives, being autonomous. So the message here is that if we want to read the benefits of agility, we need to perform the HR responsibilities differently. We can't become agile without changing HR management and organization. So the previous slide we saw essentially what can HR do for agility? But here's the other way around. What can agility do for HR? When we ask top HR leaders, they will typically shortlist a few top challenges like these four. The two first ones were talent shortage and not just attracting people also, but keeping them motivated and engaged. So can agile help with that? What are talented people looking for in the workplace? They're looking for a place where they can be creative. They're looking for a place where leverage collective intelligence, where they can be autonomous, where there is respect, where managers are courageous and there is transparency and trust. And all these values, all these principles are at the core of agility. So agility offers a great instrument to HR in order to achieve this kind of, uh, of benefits. Now, the third point here is about transformation. And of course, digital transformation is nothing new. It's undergoing since more than 10 years now. But the fourth industrial revolution, on the other hand, is very new. It's about artificial intelligence, robotics, automation. And essentially, it will give birth to a host of new functions and professions that do not yet exist now. And again, agility, by making the organization more adaptable in terms of functions and roles, will help HR to uh, solve this challenge. Well, the fourth challenge is very, very current, right? We are in this uh, COVID-19 crisis and most people work from home. They work at different times, different time zones. And this is not going uh, away after the crisis. So the, 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 the idea, the assumption that we're all going to work together as employee at the same place at the same, same time in the building downtown, this kind of assumption is obsolete. The work structure is way more fragmented. There are freelancers, there are startups within the company. It's called the gig economy. There are people working part-time and so on. So the, again, agility will help not only to keep these people together with a common focus, but also keeping them happy in an ever-changing world. So the message here is that agility provides a great tool for human resources to, uh, to solve these, these challenges. So now, unfortunately, today, the situation is not so good with HR because very often when agile people come to, to knock at HR's door, well, HR is kind of taken by surprise. It's like in a reactive mode. We ask them, okay, I need to hire a Scrum Master. What is a Scrum Master? I need to create a new function. I want to train people. What are the trainings that are available? Uh, I want some metrics about agile teams, agile, uh, agile skills. I want to coach managers to help managers to better understand agility. And uh, like I said, HR is often taken by surprise, reactive mode. And what we want to do instead is helping HR to become a kind of core leader in agile transformation and having a systematic approach toward agility instead of being always uh, uh, dealing with questions on everyday basis without looking at the root cause of that. Now let's look more a bit about agility itself. So if I ask each of you, each of you participants who was web to this webinar, what agile means for you probably will have as many different answers as there are participants. And actually it's perfectly okay because essentially it's a question of perspective. Maybe none of you is, is actually wrong. Depending on your role, the challenges you're facing, you will see agility from a different angle. And the diversity of situations uh, uh, that we try to solve agility implies that there is a diversity of flavors of agility. Actually, the opposite would be disturbing. If you find people with an agile professional who will come to you with just one method, one approach, you're in danger. Because as you know, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. 
So we need to have a look at the diversity of the methods and types of agility so that you can play your role as HR in an organization. So let's explore a bit more about these uh, approaches and methods. We, we kind of categorize them here and uh, it's not scientific by any means. The goal here is not that you become uh, a job professional today, but it's more that you have an overview of what are the kinds of approaches, methods, models, frameworks that are offered to you to solve your own challenges in your organization. So the first category is delivery method. And as the name implies, delivery methods mean that we want to deliver something. We want to, we want to uh, uh, deliver, for example, products, a project, uh, a service, and it has a beginning and an end. It's often intimately uh, tied with project management. Scrum is kind of the face, the best known of delivery methods, but these methods often have a, a big limitation. They have a limitation in size. Scrum, for example, applies to teams from five to 11 people. So what do we do when we want to deliver a bigger program, a project, a product, with maybe tens, maybe hundreds of people? Well, this gave birth along the years to delivery methods at scale. So we take the same principle that Scrum, Kanban, and so on, and we add some roles, some process, some activities to try to keep the agile dynamic, which is about delivering iteratively and incrementally and changing, pivoting as we go, but doing it at a larger scale in the organization. And SAFE is the most, the best known one, but not the only one uh, by any means. So these are delivery methods at scale. So now the third category I'd like to mention, and this category is interesting because it's not really branded to job, is the innovation and experimentation approaches. They're not branded to job, but they are very powerful in combination with a job. For example, when we're delivering uh, innovative products, products that are subject to a lot of uncertainties, well, we need to embed experimentation and discipline learning within the development cycle. And this is where these kind of approaches help. In startup, it's really at the enterprise level. We can apply to a single product and so on. Now, the fourth category, now we, get, we really go beyond the delivery paradigm. It's not just delivery. We include in the scope, in order to get organizational agility and to reach business agility, we include in the scope not just delivery roles, but roles that are typically outside of the delivery. For example, finance, HR, or procurement, marketing. And we try to really encompass the whole organization. It's not so much methods, it's more a collection of good practices. For example, Business Agility Institute has a great collection of practices. Modern Agile is really a way to, to uh, translate the Agile Manifesto, which is very IT oriented and bring it really with a complete enterprise business perspective. Well, the fifth and last category I'd like to mention, and that's kind of my preferred one because my specialty actually, is the agile leadership and agile management. So here the goal is to bring leaders, not just managers, but leaders, uh, and try to have them adopt the agile values and principles, skills, and behaviors. Servant leadership is kind of the cornerstone, I would say, of agile leadership. It's about, it's, it's like the inverted pyramid. The manager, instead of being at the top, the leader is at the bottom. He's there to support the team and to make sure they have an environment where they can perform. So there is also creative, adaptive leadership. And again, these are not branded agile. They are teach at universities, for example, and uh, they are completely in line with what we want from the agile leader in terms of the ability to make an organization agile, adaptable, and so on. So this might seem very diverse and maybe even not related, but you have to understand that there is something common at the core of all these approaches and methods, frameworks, and so on, is the human being. They're all based on the agile values of respect, courage, adaptation, focus, and so on. So they share that in common. And of course, this is a simplification. If some of you know SAFE, for example, Scrum, you might tell me, oh, but Bruno, you know, in SAFE too, there is leadership. Yeah, it's true. All these, these rectangles are in dotted line. It's just a way to, to picture the different categories and uh, the focus of the, these different approach and methods. And don't let that scare you because if you don't know Agile, it might look from outside a bit like a cult, right? It's a new vocabulary, like kind of pseudoscience. But understand that within these different approaches, there is actually a lot of common sense, 
a lot of reuse. And more importantly, if you look at it, you already have been agile yourself professionally or in your private life for sure. So that not, don't get intimidated by the, 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 the diversity of methods. Actually, the message here is that you have a wonderful and rich toolbox that you can use, you can mix and match different approaches and tools in order to reach your objectives. And as an HR person, you are very well positioned for that because you have a corporate perspective of the organization. Now let's go further and look at look at the facets of agility. Well, the kind of questions we'd like to answer now is where should I start agility in the organization? At which place do I have the most benefit and I can I start it? And when I start there, how can it evolve in the, in the organization starting from there? And to, and to answer this question, we will see three dimensions. The first one is the scope. What is becoming a job in the organization? Is it just a team? Is it a project? Is it a value stream? Value stream being uh, all the people, activities, resources that are used to take a product ID and deliver this product and then operate this product and make it evolve. Or is it even the whole enterprise that is becoming a job? Not the depth. What kind of agility? What depth agility? Is it just ways of working? If it's just ways of working, it means that you don't really change the management, you don't change governance, you don't change the leadership. Or is it really the governance? Is it agile leadership? Are you, do you want to go all the way to have an agile culture to change the DNA of your organization? These are very different levels. And then there are the benefits. What kind of benefits are you targeting or are you expecting when you move toward agility? Is it more like about engaging people, satisfaction, productivity? Do you want to accelerate value delivery? Do you want to become adaptable from a business point of view or become a market leader? And the key to understand here, and it's more very important as an HR person because you are, again, highly located to have this, this corporate perspective, is to understand there is an equation there to align the means, which is the scope and the depth, and the expectations, the target benefits. If, for example, I, I'm helping a, a 10,000 people organization to become more agile, and we're doing Scrum, which is a method, as you know, in 10% of the projects, well, maybe we'll have some engagement and some acceleration in some specific products, but we're not going to become adaptable from a business point of view. We're not going to become an innovator at the market level. So we have to make sure we are really aligned in terms of means with expectations. Now let's dig, dig a bit deeper on this because it's a very important point and I think a very uh, valuable information for HR people. On the horizontal here, we have the scope dimension all the way from one function, okay, like just IT or just HR, to enterprise, so the whole organization. We could even go farther to ecosystem, but that would be the topic for another webinar. Um, then on the vertical, we have the depth. The depth is like, okay, what is becoming a job? It's just a waste of working? Are we changing the way we work without changing the rest? Are we changing with the governance, the finance, the marketing? Are we changing the processes? like strategy, are we changing the culture itself, the leadership, the vision of the company? And without surprise, the, the most common starting point is to, is to become agile at the IT project level with Scrum, for example, which means that, yes, we're in IT, we involve a little bit other people at the project level, like other contributors that are outside of IT, and we change maybe slightly the management, the governance, but almost not at all. It's mostly the ways of working that we are we are putting on top of existing organization and we not we don't change the deep organization. A completely different angle would be to start an agile leadership coaching program with HR leaders. And then from there teach them what is servant leadership, what is value creation, entrepreneurship, and from there progressing in the organization. Complete different way of starting. Another one that is pretty common is DevOps. Here we are outside of the project paradigm. We are really a multidisciplinary team with development operations, for example. So in order for this kind of team to perform and be sustainable in organization, uh, we often have to change 
governance and management to some extent. You see the, the bubble here is really also within the second level of depth governance management processes. For example, maybe the managers there would be really trained for agility. Uh, maybe some process like procurement or will be changed, accelerated. Maybe it will have more uh, finance budgeting freedom to allocate resources. So we kind of change to some extent the process and the governance for this kind of agility. Now we have the value stream. Value stream will typically apply to a whole business product. And it will not just change the ways of working, but also the, uh, the way we, we govern, we manage, and typically the portfolio of products and projects. And then you guessed it probably, there is also enterprise agility. Enterprise and cultural agility. So it's the largest in scope and also the deeper in depth. There are some models existing like ING, Spotify model. And here, it's really the whole organization has been reinvented. There's new functions, new levels, new culture. So you can, you can guess me for, for your own situation, what would be the best starting point. And uh, for some of you, maybe starting from there and then see where you can expand. Maybe for some others, you have more, uh, let's say, receptivity to agility in HR. And you would start there at one function, HR leadership, and then expand from there. You remember we have a, a third dimension that we didn't mention yet. And that's the benefits, because it's very important to align the scope, the depth and the benefits we can expect. So here it's not very intuitive because the benefits are increasing from left to right and from top to bottom. So when we have a local agility, ways of working, we have some kind of benefits in kind of engagement, motivation, satisfaction, but nothing more than that. We reach DevOps, for example, we, can, we start really to accelerate the delivery of actual business value. When we have value stream agility, we become adaptable, innovative from a business point of view. And when we have really enterprise and cultural agility, we not just adapt, we are becoming the change. We can anticipate, we can disrupt our own market. We have we are our leader as an organization. So we see here the, the difference of expectation uh, with the, the means. And actually, the vast majority of organizations today are within this comfort zone, meaning that they're doing they're becoming agile at the project level. They're changing a little bit the management, the process. They don't go deeper. And actually, I'm not judging. It's perfectly fine. But you have to uh, you have to realize what kind of benefits we can have with this. If I say we're doing this kind of agility and want to become agile as an organization, it will not work. And second, where how can we progress from there? So for the rest of this webinar, we're going to take one specific example and dive in this example to look at the HR impacts. And we're going to take an example just there. Why there? Because we want to get a little bit out of the comfort zone that maybe, maybe some of you might already know, but not all the way to something that is maybe too uh, unrealistic for your own organizations. But before we go far farther, I'd like to share a poll with you. Actually, two questions. So you will see uh, on your screen a poll section appear. And these questions will help you also to, to become conscious of some things in your organization. So the first question, which is related to a topic we just addressed before, um, how is HR involved in agile initiatives in your organization today? So you can answer this poll and the answers will appear right away on the screen. I will leave 10 seconds, 10 more seconds. Okay. I see the poll has appeared twice. That's a mistake, I guess. It's okay, we can combine results. So what we see here is mostly contributor, occasional support, which is not a surprise, right? As we mentioned, HR is often uh, a key uh, co-leader in agility. And now we'll share a second question that is related to the diagram we just, just saw now.
Voila, and hopefully this one appears only once. Okay, so no technical glitch here. So second question in the poll section, which situation best reflects agility in your organization today? This refers directly to the diagram we just saw now together. Okay, I will leave five more seconds. Not everyone is answering, but that's okay. You answer if you want to. It's not for me to collect information. It's more for you to become conscious of, of the situation. Okay, so without surprise, we see that it's mostly no agility, team agility, multidisciplinary agile, agile teams, and some agile leadership. That's good. Interesting. Okay, we're going to uh, to move on with the the presentation thank you now let's dig deep in or dive deep in our example so our example is a multidisciplinary team in an environment adapted for agility it means that the team itself is agile it is multidisciplinary but the rest of the organization has not changed much okay and uh, the goal here is not to describe the mechanism of agile of the method, but more to understand the bare minimum in order to look at the HR impact of this kind of organization. So the product owner role, the goal is to really maximize value. Agile coach is to, to make sure people have, are equipped in terms of agility for by values, methods, tools, and so on. We're going to look at seven characteristics that distinguish this kind of organization from a traditional organization. So the first one we see it's multidisciplinary. So we see it's spanning business, production, operations. What we mean here is that this team there has all the skills to take an ID and bring it to a product and operate it. So the production here could be IT, but it could also be manufacturing, for example. It could be anything depending on the, on the nature of the company. But it's not just important to be multidisciplinary as a team. We need people to be able to help people to help to be able sorry to help each other. So we need versatile individuals. So we see you see these three circles there. They overlap, and they overlap because people can help each other. Maybe someday they will do more business, someday more production, and will create flexibility within the team. The third characteristic is about autonomy. So autonomy is a very broad word, and used sometimes not in the right context, there are two main flavors of autonomy. The first is self-organization, which means that within the team, we can organize ourselves. We can decide which roles we have. Maybe this month I will be in production, but next month, because of change of priority, I will do more operations. It's not a matter that will tell us that. We organize that by ourselves. We organize the rules to where we work, when we work, what kind of documents, and so on, where we meet, when we meet. So all these rules are within the, 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 the freedom of the team. And self-management refers more to decision-making. It means that in terms of product, we decide as a team, and mostly with the product owner, what the product will be, what is important in the product, and some governance, for example, where we allocate resources or budget. This is not from outside. It's managed within the team. So it's a big difference from a traditional organization that will have, for example, a steering committee uh, to make these decisions. Here, it's really the team is autonomous to make these kind of decisions. Fourth difference, we're not in product mode. Project has a beginning and an end. It means that in the end, people are disbanded and they're allocated to other projects, other teams. Here, it's long term. So the team is gaining maturity and they come and trust as they, as they progress and they deliver value continuously. Fifth point, we mentioned that the rest of the organization is not real agile. So we need kind of interfaces. See there at the, the bottom left, we need interfaces with existing processes and functions in the organization. And maybe we adapted some. For example, uh, we have more financial freedom. We have maybe accelerated procurement uh, process because we are agile. We have maybe another way to do HR functions like evaluating performance or defining roles. So we, we interface with the rest of the organization so that we can function in an agile way without breaking the rest of the organization and vice versa. The sixth point is about management. 
That's a huge difference. We have a single manager. If this was a matrix traditional organization, each of these little people there in the bubbles would report to a different manager. He would just have one manager for the whole multidisciplinary team. And more importantly, this manager is a servant leader. He's not at the top, he's at the bottom. He's there to help the team perform, provide the environment that is efficient, physical environment, technological environment, but also psychological environment, so that people have trust in order to, for example, learn. A corollary of that is that we also want the people to be free to experiment and they could make mistakes because in agility, we want to deliver innovative product and you can't learn without sometimes making mistakes. So now let's have a, let's have a look at three change of paradigms that uh, are the consequence of these, uh, these changes there. And that affect, of course, greatly human resources. The first one is that we're moving from delegation to autonomy. And that's a huge difference because these words are often confused and actually they have a very different meaning. Delegation, for example, is typically we delegate the how, we delegate a task and uh, the person who is delegating keeps the decision power, the accountability. Autonomy, on the other hand, is for a whole objective. And the people who receive autonomy, they have the freedom on how to achieve the objective on the longer term. They have the decision power and they are accountable for results. So this one main difference. The second big difference is that delegation typically applies to individual. It's one person delegating a task to another one. Whereas autonomy is by definition collective. You can't self-organize if you're alone. Self-organization works if you are multiple people to work together. And autonomy gives a framework for self-organization and self-management. And the third point, delegation is typically one direction. Of course, the most common example that comes to mind is one manager, boss manager, delegating a task to one employee who has to come back to him two days later with the result. Well, autonomy is about negotiation. It means that it's negotiated between the leader and the team. And uh, it's actually counterintuitive because you might think that people want the maximum autonomy possible, but it's not true. In order for me to accept autonomy, I need trust and transparency or else I'm going to take a personal risk. So an enabler of autonomy is trust and transparency. The second big paradigm shift that is, that is implied by our example and the seven characteristics, remember the seven characteristics of the example, is that we're moving from a specialist to generalizing specialist in terms of roles. And this might sound a bit academic, but actually it's super concrete and super simple also. In most organizations today, we are, uh, our career path follows specialization. You start junior, then you become medium, then senior, the expert, and so on. And your skill set becomes more and more narrow. And that creates actually fragility. It creates the opposite of agility because everyone can do just one thing. Now, another common profile is generalized, which is a kind of, I would say, jack of all trades and master of none. And this is also, of course, very limiting because he might be very flexible, but he doesn't have any specific expertise. So what we're looking for in agility is a generalizing specialist. It's someone who has some degree of specialty, maybe not as, as developed as a pure specialist, but who developed the horizontal bar of the T. So all the skills, we often call, we call that a T-shaped profile. And thanks to this profile, if priorities changes, if, if workloads changes, well, people can help each other and can adjust. So generalizing specialists as individuals make for flexible teams and flexible teams makes for an adaptable agile organization. But it's not just the skills, it's also the authorization. Look at this picture to the right. The person who's tracing this white line certainly has the skills to get off his vehicle and move the branch out of the way, right? So why didn't he do it? He's not stupid. He didn't do it because he's not authorized to do so. If he does so, if he gets off his machine, he will take a personal risk and might be evaluated negatively. 
So it's not just about the skills, it's also defining the jobs and functions and managing people so that they can be flexible and develop this T-shaped profile. In terms of HR, it impacts, of course, the, the type of people we recruit, T-shaped people. It, it impacts the way we define functions and jobs, not just specialists, but also people who, can, who have connected skill sets and also the way we manage so that people are encouraged to develop other skills they might not be good at the beginning. Again, right to make mistakes, the right to learn. The three paradigm shift is about moving from a deterministic system to an adaptive system. The reality is that most of us who have been educated and drilled as a professional to try to understand everything. We want to understand who is going to do what, when and how. We want, to, we want a, a detailed process. And when things change, when we are disrupted, the organization is, is in danger. The world doesn't work like that. We need uh, the, the organization as a, as a whole is actually a complex adaptive system. So we need to reflect that. And uh, in agility, we often use the, the metaphor of the gardener. Look at the gardener. He wants to have a nice vegetable patch, nice ore cart. But the thing is, he can't really direct that in a deterministic way. He cannot yell at tomatoes. Hey, no, you have to grow. No, you have to become red. He cannot do that. It doesn't work. What he can do, though, is make sure that he choose the right seeds, that the tomatoes have sunshine, that they have space, that he waters them every day, that the, the soil is fertile. In other words, he's working on the environment, on the system, so that the vegetables and the fruits can grow. Well, it's the same in agility. In an agile organization, we are all gardeners of the for the people around us. And... Um, Lewin's equation is very uh, illustrative of this. The behaviors, what we see, is function of the person, like the personality, the value, and his or her environment. Maybe you already met with people who uh, were not very happy in a team and considered like not a good performer. And when she moves to another team, another organization, suddenly she's happy and she's performing well. What changed? It's the same person, it's the same P exactly. What changed is the E, is the environment. 80% of our individual performance depends on the environment we're working in. And that, of course, has a huge impact, notably on the management or leadership style, which is in the, 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 the territory the responsibilities of HR, because we want certain leaders, we want people to understand, leaders who understand that you have to create an environment where others can grow and not try to control them. So now we are ready to look at more in detail, specifically four HR responsibilities that are really heavily affected by this kind of changes. What can we do in HR for that? So the first one is recruitment. Culture fit. You probably heard that very often, right? And uh, we, we tend to hire people with, uh, that are just like us. But actually, we would, should rather hire people who can help us to stretch a bit our culture. So culture add instead of culture fit. A jar-friendly profile. We want Remember, we want T-shaped people, versatile people. So we will emphasize values, attitudes, ability to learn versatility. And it doesn't mean that expertise or technical skills is not important. It's just less important than the values and the learning abilities. Selection process. Instead of filling in a long resume, why not ask candidates to shoot themselves with a, a video, video of themselves for three minutes and send that to the company to show who they are, what they like, what they don't like, which is much more, much better reflection of themselves than a dry document, right? Job definition, another HR responsibility that is heavily impacted by these changes in this example we show. Well, job foundation is essentially a reflection of uh, recruitment. So we define jobs on objectives and intentions. A job is not about telling people what to do. If you hire someone, it's because precisely they are intelligent enough to know how to do it. Job, a job description is not a list of tasks. It's about the intention and the objective. Formal functions with versus roles. This is a bit more tricky. We want, uh, on one hand, we have some stability in functions because the functions are connected to 
legal aspects, uh, policies, unions, and so on. So you can't change functions every month, every day. On the other hand, you can change rules much faster. So rules reflect more the day-to-day -day changing reality. And the role of HR here is to provide a framework also for the different sectors like IT, like lines of business, like marketing, to change the roles and create roles and add them continuously to their own reality without necessarily affecting the, the, the formal functions themselves. So the, the roles are built on the functions. And one pitfall to avoid, which is the third point, is don't create a formal function for every agile methodology roles. If you have Scrum, you have Scrum Master, Product Owner. If you have, if you have Safe, you might have a release screen engineer, a business owner. And before you know it, you will have hundreds of formal functions for different methods that are used at different places in the organization and changing every three months. And instead of bringing uh, agility, you will actually have reached rigidity because you are stuck with agile specific methods. So keep the formal functions separated from agile methodology. Now, the third HR responsibility that is heavily uh, influenced by this example is how to manage performance. And the first thing is that we actually have to completely redefine performance. The traditional definition is about reaching results on the short term is transactional. Actually, uh, evidence shows that reaching result is a side effect of learning continuously and collaborating. And collaborating mean, what means what? Meaning asking for help and offering help. So when we manage performance, we, we evaluate performance. First and foremost, we have to evaluate how are you learning? How are you improving? And are you helping others? Are you open to get help? These are the key points in uh, improving performance for people and uh, the organization itself. Also, uh, annual performance evaluations are usually disengaging, let's be honest. I barely know what I did one month ago. How would I remember what I did one year ago? So we really have to have much more frequent, more informal conversations to uh, evaluate performance. And last point, performance is collective. Not only is evaluated by multiple people, which is nothing new, it's like 360 evaluation. But more importantly, you evaluate the performance of a team. There are organizations today, for real, where people in the team have, of course, a salary. They are rewarded with a salary. And the team receives a salary. And because the team is self-organized, it can, it can spread by itself the salary among its members. So it's a way to create incentive and reward at a team level and uh, optimize collective performance because as you know if you go too much in individual performance it might hurt collective performance so the fourth point now is about agile leadership and here this model is created by myself is based on different uh, existing good practices the seven leader we already mentioned but it's not just about making people happy and growing the, com the company is also delivering value delivering products and services so as a leader you have to understand what is the value you created? What is your place in the flow of value? And so the company is changing constantly. So as a leader, you have to be an entrepreneur. It's like an entrepreneur, but inside the company. We have to make sure that you can identify the good ideas, validate them quickly by experimenting, making mistakes sometimes, and then making sure that the good ideas, the promising ones, get realized. And whatever your role is, whether you're in product, ma product management, product management, HR director, somewhere you, you, you will be somewhere in these three triangles, maybe with more emphasis on one dimension than the other. So I have one last little poll for you, and then we'll go we'll look at the, the questions. 